The Mad Scientist, a weird cultural staple in the Rolodex of American cultural tropes. It's been around for over two centuries and it still continues to fascinate us to this day. In fact, a survey of horror films distributed in the UK between the 1930s and the 1980s showed that mad scientists and their creations made up about 30% of the movie's villains. And perhaps even more revealing that the scientists were only the heroes in the story 11% of the time. Serves those dorks right. Imagine working your whole life to have a well-respected and well-paying position. Go fuck yourself. According to a 2023 Pew Pew Research Center survey, 27% of Americans say they have not too much or no confidence at all in scientists. Which is crazy because most Americans I know can't spell the word confidence without sticking out their tongue. But to be fair, scientists have had a relatively sketchy past. In 1932, there was that whole Tuskegee uh, University study that was not cool. They injected hundreds of black men with syphilis and then tracked its progress without ever giving them a diagnosis or even penicillin, which would have cured the disease. And then in the 1940s, US scientists injected thousands of Guatemalans with STDs just to see what would happen. And from 1955 to 1976, New Zealand scientists left hundreds of women with precancerous lesions untreated to see if they developed cervical cancer. Jesus Christ. But all of these studies have one thing in common. It was a bunch of scientists just wanting to see what would happen. Two-headed dogs, cryogenics, mind control. These sound like terrible plots in horrible sci-fi movies, but these were all real experiments done by real-world mad scientists. And I think it goes without saying today that we're going to look over some of this awful science that has been done in the past and the rest of this video. And I'm going to do my best to not get demonetized, but I mean, the World's Fair video got demonetized and I was pretty tame in that one. So here we go. So to begin, let's start off by jumping into the world of fiction. Even though the people in these books did not technically exist, the lore surrounding them makes you think, hmm, I didn't know shit was so fucked up back then, and damn, Stephen King needs to get back on cocaine. Up first, we got the good old-fashioned classic, Dr. Frankenstein. Mary Shelley is often credited for creating the first mad scientist in her 1818 novel, Frankenstein. I don't know how you wouldn't know this, but in the book, Dr. Frankenstein assembles a bunch of dead body parts together and then brings his creation to life, and that's this, that's this thing. Now, a lot of book readers nerds will tell you that this is not Frankenstein, its name is actually Frankenstein's monster, but you could probably beat up those people, so do what you want, it's not really that important. But the historic aspects of this novel being written are much more real than anyone would actually want. Shelley wasn't making up the whole using corpses thing as a spook. In the 18th and 19th century, the demand for cadavers did not meet the supply. Now, what was the demand for cadavers? I don't know, but that's the most of my worries. This shortage was because of laws like the UK's Murder Act of 1751, which stipulated that only the executed could be used for dissection. Once again, didn't think we'd be needing to make laws about this, but I guess so. This created an underground market for cadavers, and that's not a graveyard joke, people were digging up dead bodies. Body snatchers would dig up dead bodies and then sell them to medical schools. And body snatching, weirdly, was actually perfectly legal. That was until the Anatomy Act of 1832, because before that, the corpse had no legal standing, it wasn't considered anyone's property. And I didn't know how many laws we needed to make about people's dead bodies, but apparently it was more than two. But as long as you didn't take any of the possessions the person was buried with, and you yourself didn't do the dissection, you could legally scoop bodies out of the ground as if they were little wormies. So yeah, the book about Dr. Frankenstein was creepy, but the fact that it was based off of like real world events that were going on at that time is way more terrifying to me. But the book was a sensation, and in 1931 they made a movie about it, creating the first image that everyone saw of a mad scientist. Moving on from the green guy, let's head over to Dr. Moreau. H.G. Wells' 1896 novel, The Island of Dr. Moreau, created an entirely new lane for mad scientists. One where performing live surgery on animals, also known as vivisections, led to animal-human hybrid. Hybrids. I don't know. In the novel, Dr. Moreau takes an entire island's population and fills it with half-human hybrids. But wait, it gets sexier. He insists that they reject their animal nature and start acting more like humans, and eventually things go sideways when a half-human, half-puma lady kills him. I told you things were gonna get sexier, you should've believed me. There have been tons of remakes and homages to the island of Dr. Moreau, but the disturbing part is how many children's shows have referenced Dr. Moreau. Ninja Turtles, Batman the Animated Series, Johnny Bravo, Pinky and the Brain, and Courage the Cowardly Dog all had episodes heavily inspired by Dr. Moreau. I mean, it's the entire premise of Spy Kids 2. I think God stays in heaven for he too fears what he created. Maybe it's the implausibility of the story that makes it so geared towards children's media. However, in 2022, researchers at Stanford transplanted a cluster of human brain cells in the cortex of a newborn rat. Why would they do that? So, I guess the story of Dr. Moreau is not that far-fetched, but also, who is offering grant money to do such a dumb thing? That poor rat is gonna start leaving hateful messages on her pretty girl's Instagrams and gambling down in Atlantic City. It does not deserve to have that hell. Anyway, 
anyway, Dr. Moreau was a huge step forward in the mad scientist culture wars, and we have H.G. Wells to thank for it. He also wrote The Invisible Man and War of the Worlds, so obviously he was working through some shit, but I'm glad he put that shit to paper. How about this classic known as Dr. Jekyll? While the trope that the scientist was more evil than its creation was well known by the 19th century, Dr. Jekyll was one of the first characters that literally encapsulated both. In the 1886 novella The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a scientist creates a serum that separates himself from his evil urges. Which, if we examine that concept a little too closely, we can find some pretty serious flaws. You're telling me you have the capability to make a serum that creates such a powerful disassociation that you can't remember your actions or feelings, but you can't make a serum that just stops your evil urges? It's, you could just make like a THC tincture. Those things aren't even that expensive. And it's not like Dr. Jekyll's evil fantasies were light felonies like theft or throwing a brick through a window. When Dr. Jekyll transformed into Mr. Hyde, he murdered people. He just, he wanted to kill a bunch of people. It was like Mr. Hyde's favorite thing to do. It was like murder, Rocky Road ice cream, and probably manslaughter right under that. And also, when I was a kid, I always assumed Dr. Jekyll was the evil one, because Mr. Hyde sounds way less evil than Dr. Jekyll. Well, actually not anymore nowadays, now that I think about it. So eventually in the story, uh, Mr. Hyde becomes so powerful that he overpowers Dr. Jekyll, and Dr. Jekyll is no more. Mr. Hyde's just a murdering psychopath. And I guess the moral of the story is don't murder people, or don't drink fizzing potions. I don't, I don't, I didn't read the book, obviously. But the story is so ingrained in our culture that we use the term Jekyll and Hyde to describe somebody that's like two-faced. And also, the children's show Arthur had an episode where the brain did a parody of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I mean, first of all, the brain was voiced by Steven Crowder, which is insane. But in that episode, he, the, the brain sings a little song that has been stuck in my brain since I was a toddler. Jekyll, Jekyll, Hyde, Jekyll, Hyde, Hyde, Jekyll. Jekyll, Jekyll, Hyde, Jekyll, Hyde. That's been, that's been in my head since day one. And there's other examples of mad scientists throughout literature. I mean, Lex Luthor was a straight up mad scientist before they rebranded him as like a CEO for some reason. But I think it's time to jump into the real psychopaths of the world who actually existed, AKA real world mad scientists. But before we do that, I'm gonna show you a sponsor that's gonna make you say, gee whiz, I wanna give him my money. <laughs> Roll the clip. One of the worst parts about becoming an adult is not the fact that you have to get a job or the fact that no one makes you meals anymore. No, truly the worst part about becoming an adult is the fact that at one point your family start kicking you off of all the subscription plans. Internet streaming, it's all on you, baby. Suddenly and without warning. And to top it all off, you're in charge of finding a mobile phone plan that's not gonna suck and also take all of your money at the same time. Enter Mint Mobile, the sponsor of today's video. Straight up, Mint Mobile is affordable, hassle-free, and has great plans depending on anyone's budget. But Tucker, why is it so cheap? Is it because it's bad? No, you fool, you buffoon. They don't have retail stores or salespeople, so when they cut out the overhead that comes with that kind of thing, it makes things a lot easier for the regular customer. Mint Mobile offers premium wireless with coverage on the T-Mobile network. And that looks like this, if you're not familiar. It's very blanket-like. And all plans include unlimited talk, text, and data on the nation's largest 5G network. Plus free calling to Mexico and Canada in case you got some international friends. But Tucker, I'm already on another mobile phone plan and I've heard it's very hard to switch over. What did I tell you about being stupid? Are you trying to make me angry? You can sign up and activate in minutes using eSIM from the comfort of your home. And keep your phone number and all your contacts active when you switch. Not that hard when you really think about it. They're also extremely transparent. They don't try and hide stuff or confuse you with corporate jargon. They're even known to tell you that you should be paying less because you're using a package that's not suited for you. That's unheard of in this industry. So if you want to switch up your mobile phone carrier and be happy to do so, check the link down below. New customers can get the unlimited plan for $15 a month for the first three months. Mint Mobile, changing the game of telecommunication. That's not their slogan. I don't know what their slogan is, but they should use that. Another free slogan for a fantastic company. So before we get into this segment, I have to give the disclaimer that we're not going to talk about Nazis. We're just not going to do that. This is going to be a mad scientist speed run, no Nazis edition, because if we mentioned Nazis, then the entire list was going to be Nazis, and that's just not fun. Starting off on the lighter end of the evil spectrum, we got William Buckland, or Billy Buck for short. William Buckland wasn't the conventional mad scientist. He wasn't conducting insane experiments like some other freaks of his time. I mean, he was one of the first to look at cave exploration as a way to study former ages, so that's pretty important. Uh, and he did discover Megalosaurus, the first dinosaur in 1822, which must have been fucking crazy. Can you imagine digging into the ground and finding dragon bones? I would have just, I would have given up. But Buckland wasn't a mad scientist. He was more of a scientist that over time went mad. He became well known for his eccentric teaching methods when he was a, a professor at Oxford. He would yell at students while thrusting a hyena skull at them, which sounds silly, but I mean, I, I wouldn't forget that lecture for sure. But he was probably best known for his diet. Billy Buck was, for lack of a better term, obsessed with meat. 
paws. And not like in an all-American wearing a bib that says I love BBQ kind of way. Buckland literally would eat anything that he came across. This gets gross almost immediately, so buckle up. Reportedly, his favorite snack was mice on toast, little rats. He would put those on toast and eat them. But he also ate sea slugs, kangaroos, porpoise, panther, and puppies. Not dogs, puppies. His goal was to apparently eat everything that was living on Earth. And if you're wondering if he ever got around to eating human, that's a silly question. He's a man of science. Of course he did do that. But he didn't just eat any normal human being. He ate a part of King Louis the 14th of France, which is crazy because we were just talking about him in the last video. But he didn't eat any normal part of Lou. No, he decided to go for the mummified heart, probably the worst form of jerky anyone has ever consumed. Apparently being a scientist in the early 19th century just meant you were a witch at some point. But I think we knew that. I mean, everything was a nightmare back then. Being a, a medical scientist in the 19th century is an oxymoron in itself. Moving down the line of insanity, we have Jose Rodriguez Delgado. Being a Spanish neurologist, he was well known for his time for being a technical wizard. And using his raw brain power, he invented uh, the Stimosiever, a series of electrodes that created a two-way connection with the brain. Immediately, you can see the sci-fi story we're about to crash land into, right? From the 1950s to the 70s, his work focused on simulating the brains of cats, monkeys, and humans. You know, the main three geniuses of the animal world. He claimed that he was able to control or elicit emotions and that stimulating particular parts of the brain could bring about pleasant, elated, contemplative, or relaxed feelings. So in essence, he was doing mind control on monkeys, which I think gives him a top spot on the evil scientist list. Delgado also believed that electric stimulation would become the number one way to treat the mentally ill instead of just oral medicine, which is why you always heard about people who were mentally ill in the past getting shock therapy treatment, and that wasn't too cool, that wasn't sick. So obviously Delgado turned out to be wrong about that little fact. As science created more successful drugs to treat mental illness, the the public became less confident in me brain mutilating surgery, pretty much. And then he got himself into like a bullfight, and I'm not using that as like an allegory. He, he got into an actual bullfight. In 1963, Rodriguez Delgado implanted a stimosiever in a fighting bull and then enticed the bull by waving around a, a red flag. Science, baby. And as the bull approached him, he activated the electrodes and the bull got all confused and dizzy and he didn't charge uh, Rodriguez. So okay, the electrodes work, but like, of course they would. If you shock any animal's brain, at the very least, it's gonna need to circle back. It's gonna be confused fused as a motherfucker. And then Delgado really fell out of favor with the scientific community when he published a book called Physical Control of the Mind Towards a Psycho-Civilized Society. That's some real evil villain shit. Like, yes, society probably would be better if we were all mind-controlled by electrodes, but I want- I like free will. I like the fact that I can wake up and eat seven Pop-Tarts if I want to. Now let's get a little bit more evil with Sergei Brokeneko and Vladimir Demikov. In the early 20th century, Sergei developed the Autojector, a heart-lung machine. And yes, he was a Soviet. I can't stop talking about the USSR in my videos. This is like the ninth one in a row. I'm not gonna lead softly into this story because it gets pretty gruesome pretty quickly, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. To test the machine, he regularly decapitated dogs. Yeah. And then he'd keep their heads alive by using the autojector. Not great, not a good look. He would demonstrate that the heads were alive by flashing lights into them and ringing loud bells in their ears. And he'd feed them little pieces of cheese. Jesus, fuck. And I don't know what's going on in Russia during this time period, but apparently all the scientists fucking hated dogs. In 1954, Vladimir Demikov tried to show the possibility of a heart and lung transplant by creating a two-headed dog. Literally what the island of that fucking crazy guy was doing. He stitched together the head and front paws of a puppy onto the back neck of a German shepherd. Over a 10 year period, he would make 20 of these double dogs and none of them lived for more than a month. Hey Vlad, do you know what the definition of insanity is? Maybe after the 18th abomination died on you, you'd think, hey, maybe I'm fucking up in a horrible way. Jack Parsons, how about Jack Parsons? That name sounds normal and not horrifying. So Jack Parsons is considered one of the most important figures in the US space program. He was the founder of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and pioneered major advancements in liquid fuel and solid fuel rockets. All good stuff so far. And Parsons did all of this despite being a college dropout, so it's kind of motivational. And also he was a full-blown member of the occult. Fuck! God damn it. In the early 40s, Parsons started hanging out with somebody called Aleister Crowley. And if you don't know who that is, congratulations, you're a well-adjusted adult. Parsons would soon become a part of the occult commune and start doing magic rituals, making bathtub absinthe, and taking tons of drugs like cocaine, speed, morphine, and peyote. Making rockets. This guy was making rockets. This is where he met, and I'm, you know what? I'm gonna make you guess who you think he met at this point in his life. A drug-doing occult member of a rocket scientist team. Who do you think he was hanging out with? Three, two, one, that's right. L. Ron Hubbard, creator of the Church of Scientology. What the fuck? The two really hit it off, even though Hubbard technically stole uh, Parsons' girlfriend, which is a historically documented thing that happened. I don't know why people know about that. Parsons and Hubbard allegedly uh, did sex magic rituals together, and I don't know what that looked like, but I don't want to get demonetized, so I'm not going to bring it up. Apparently, they were trying to summon a sex goddess who Parsons believed would teach the world how to love. So I guess his heart was in the right place. I don't know. As the U.S. space program was becoming more regimented, Parsons was pushed out due to his erratic behavior, let's say. Out of work and with only his sex magic to occupy him, he started calling himself the anti 
Antichrist which seems like a logical step. Hubbard would eventually defraud Parsons of all his money, and then over the next couple years, both of them would try and cast magic spells at each other, like pew pew, uh, I, I summon financial troubles. And this carried on until 1952, when Parsons would blow himself up in a lab. Apparently, his last words as he laid in the wreckage were, but I'm not finished yet, which could be seen as either an inspirational quote for young scientists, or a horrifying quote for evangelical Christians. Life's all about perspective. So there you have it, those are all the mad scientists that uh, I thought I could talk about without getting in real trouble. Sorry if I look a little bit disheveled at this point in the video. I filmed an entire part about modern day mad scientists, but the microphone failed, so we can't, well, maybe we'll make a part two. Sorry if it's a little bit shorter than regular, but I'm, you know, just be happy I'm making videos because I am on the, I'm on the edge of mental decline. Like, comment, and subscribe. New videos every Saturday, sometimes Wednesday, and if you had the power to be a mad scientist, what would you create? And don't mention sex or race. Thank you.